So I guess the question stated another way, is the ketogenic diet optimal for exercise performance and gaining muscle? I would say no. But if you're if you want to enhance body composition in regards to maximum fat loss and muscle retention, I would say that a modified ketogenic diet is probably superior for some people. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome to Live Longer World. I am your host Asta and in this podcast I speak with longevity scientists working to slow and reverse aging. To find all podcast episodes and other resources, go to my website livelongerworld.com. To find the link to the show notes for this episode, check out the description below. You said you take a beta hydroxy butyrate supplement. Um, is that to elevate your ketone bodies even more in addition to the modified keto diet you do? Yeah, the diet that I follow is like, it's actually pretty heavy in carbohydrates relative to a ketogenic diet because I'm eating a lot of cruciferous vegetables, a lot of Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, asparagus, and uh, berries, I have berries every night and a little bit of dark chocolate. Uh, and, and, you know, I try to get some nuts too, maybe walnuts or uh, almonds occasionally. But uh, so my, my beta hydroxybutyrate in the morning is, is really low, like 0 0.3, 0 0.2, something like that. But at, throughout the day, it t as my metabolism revs up, I'm usually about like one. But I like to get it up to one like in the morning. And I think mm. that actually elevates beta hydroxybutyrate enough with like a ketone electrolyte salt to start getting some of the signaling effects, the anti-inflammatory effects, the epigenetic effects even, and the signaling effects. So yeah, I take, uh, there's different salts like on the market. You could do MCTs too. I don't take a ketone ester, although we tend to do a lot of research with them for different things, but it's a product called Keto Start. It has sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. So it's in a formulation that you can consume enough that it doesn't cause GI upset and can get your ketones as high as like two if you want it. But I just take like a third of the packet in the morning. I can feel it. And then I take the rest of the packet like midday. And, uh, and the ketones do give your brain a little bit of a kick and you feel it. I mix it. I'm a big proponent of creatine monohydrate. So I take ketone electrolytes with creatine monohydrate and uh, acetyl L-carnitine. So mm -hmm. on a keto diet, your body's transporting a lot of fat to the mitochondria. In kids, we tend to see carnitine depletion in kids, especially if they're not eating meat. So, uh, and acetyl L-carnitine crosses the blood brain barrier. It's kind of like people use it as a nootropic. Studies are being done on depression with it. So there's a lot of very interesting things. So it's one of the few supplements that I take. Um, trying to think of the supplements, so vitamin D, magnesium, creatine, beta hydroxybutyrate salts, melatonin, I do take at night, I know that's a bit controversial. And then uh, NMN. Uh, so, so the ketogenic diet will elevate NAD plus, but I've been experimenting with a supplement that's nicotine mononucleotide with resveratrol. And I've used it on and off and trying to get an opinion about it. I think, uh, I think there's some benefits, especially with, uh, when I take a higher dose and I exercise, it gives me a second wind. So, and I think maybe the benefits may occur, like you, the more you use it, the mm. longer you use it, the particular product, it's called Verso. And I don't, I don't know, but like who the scientist is involved. I don't know if it's David Sinclair, or what if he has his own supplement line or whatever, but I've tried different things in the past and I used it and I was not very convinced, but my wife kept telling me <laughs> that it was working and she's not, she doesn't really, she doesn't have a favorable view of most supplements. So I took it. I said, I didn't notice anything, but then I doubled the dose because they were sending us a lot. And then I was, uh, I started swimming and I noticed that, uh, I didn't tell her at the time, but then I started taking it more. And I was like, yeah, I feel it, but only if I'm really pushing myself aerobically. Uh, so, I mean, for athletes and stuff, it might be interesting. And, you know, maybe if you're older in the seventies and eighties too, it might become more relevant to take an NAD supplement. And I know this is a very hot topic in longevity <laughs> science. Right. I, I think there's also some debate on it that it doesn't, most of the studies show that 
you know, may not actually be having that many lifespan benefits. But I do know anecdotally, a lot of people will say, especially all the people that they feel more energetic. So yeah. I'm not sure, maybe that's something that works better in humans. Maybe it's placebo. Maybe it is working in some people. I, I have no idea. I was skeptical. I sat on uh, study sections in federal grants reviewing <laughs> some of the mouse data and things like that. Uh, and was skeptical. But then more and more grants started coming in. And then I saw evidence that it was getting through the GI tract, through the liver, making it to the brain, having some interesting effects, you know, actually boosting brain tissue levels. Uh, and the critique has been, well, it gets to the liver, and but it doesn't get past. But then I'm thinking like, like, you know, elevating NAD in the liver is probably a good thing. I mean, the liver is like the master metabolic regulator. So keeping the liver healthy is probably one of the most important things. So it's, it might be a good thing that you're, you know, through first pass metabolism, your the liver is getting hit with a big dose of NAD that might be uh, an anti-aging strategy for the liver. But, uh, but some of the new data is showing that, you know, it's getting into the muscles. And then I have friends that are doing NAD uh, shots. There some of them are doing IV, some of them are injecting. And they're telling me that it's working. I haven't tried it yet, but uh, I, I kind of, a few of them, I really believe, you know, because uh, they don't make things up and they've tried other things and said it didn't work. So I'm kind of curious. Uh, although I think my NAD levels are probably pretty good. The ketogenic diet increases NAD. So you asked about the mechanisms of the ketogenic diet. And uh, I was I chaired the American Epilepsy special interest group on dietary therapies. And we had a speaker, Marwan Elliman, uh, that was, uh, she was a first author on a paper review article that discussed NAD as the main mechanism behind the beneficial effects of the ketogenic diet. And there's pretty compelling evidence that uh, the, the ketogenic diet induced increase in NAD is contributing to some of the therapeutic benefits. Hmm, fascinating. Well, mm -hmm. what biomarkers do you track? Uh, in our, well, I, personally, and in our study too, uh, I wear a continuous glucose monitor. So glycemic variability, so you can get directly know your average glucose. And then insulin, hemoglobin A1C, which is interesting to compare with average glucose, high sensitivity C-reactive protein, so HSCRP, triglycerides, um, and blood pressure is probably one that I've been, you know, uh, really interested in lately. And I would love to have a continuous blood pressure monitor because I see how it changes under di different circumstances. Mm -hmm. So glucose ketones and ketones through uh, breath ketone device and uh, blood ketones too. And yeah, actually I use a ZRT cardio metabolic kit. And we use this, we do some research with NASA in extreme environments and these kits, you can actually just put blood on a, on a card and you don't have to do, you don't need a phlebotomist. And then you can send it to the lab, just like a Quest Labs or LabCorp and get, and get data on that. And we're using that in our registered clinical trial uh, to test uh, continuous glucose monitoring as a behavioral tool to optimize uh, metabolic health. So we're doing that now, we're using levels software as a software that's kind of tracking and things like that. So that we're almost done with our second cohort. So we have some interesting data coming in. We presented some of it at experimental biology and at USF and then at metabolic health summit, we have some, some things. So yeah, I think the ones that are super important are uh, glucose ketones. If you're doing a ketogenic diet, uh, insulin, HSCRP triglycerides, LDL, HDL. So that's another thing we can talk about cholesterol and, uh, and blood pressure. I mean, that's kind of, and then of course I do a CBC, like I do a complete blood panel, you know, CBC, CMP, uh, at least once a year, I like two or three times a year, I try to do it, but at least once a year, I always do that. Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. In terms of LDL, I guess, I think a common concern on ketogenic diets is that it would raise the LDL levels. Do you think that's a concern at all? Or do you think, I mean, it, something like APOB or LPA is a better marker for um, just heart disease in general? 
Yeah, we added ApoB to uh, to our panel because the cardio metabolic kit does not measure that. So we added ApoB, and uh, and that goes up too a little bit, but not not as much. Uh, so I, I think uh, you know LDL. I have to say that my LDL did skyrocket in the beginning, mm. but everything else improved. So HDL went up. My HDL was in like the 80s. And that's, that's really good. Uh, and my triglycerides went down like below 50s. I had one that was like 39 in the 40s. So triglycerides went down. Uh, but the persistently elevated LDL is a concern for people who have uh, heart disease in their family. And also, if the other biomarkers are not going in the right direction. So mm -hmm. if you have, uh, if you're glucose, hemoglobin, A1C, triglycerides, if these things are not significantly improving and you have a uh, significantly elevated LDL as a consequence of a ketogenic diet, you need to make some changes. I would recommend, cautiously recommend. And some changes that you can make is actually switching out. I reduce my dairy fat intake and uh, animal protein, animal fat derived, you know, saturated fat to more monounsaturated fat, uh, a lot of fish, a lot of uh, extra virgin olive oil and MCTs, which is a saturated fat. Um, but I think, you know, when I first started doing the ketogenic diet, I was getting a lot of butter, heavy cream and dairy fat. And just simply reducing that and um, eating a lot more fish, like just omega-3s alone. So say you did nothing else, but just started like mega dosing omega-3, you would see some improvements in, in your lipid profile across the board, including LDL. Um, and yeah, I mean, I don't think like eating a ribeye steak, two pounds of ribeye steak every day. Is <laughs> it's probably, I know people are doing that and they're getting benefits from that. And there's probably, you know, if you were, equating for calories and your body composition is good and everything. You're probably not doing that much harm, but I, I don't think it's optimal. So, right. I don't think it's optimal. So if we want optimal uh, biomarkers, I think it would be wise and prudent to try, attempt to prevent a decrease in LDL with a ketogenic diet. And in the beginning, I was thinking maybe 15% of people experience this, but I think it's more like 50 or 60% based upon the research that we're doing. And there are different strategies that you can do. Just getting more plant-based fiber in, getting, you know, like I said, monounsaturated fats, keeping saturated fat, you know, of, of all your fat, keeping it like 20 to 25% or less is, is one thing that you can do. And, you know, even eggs, I'm a big fan of, you know, replacing some meat with eggs. I've been doing that lately. And, uh, and I give some of the, like the yolks to my dogs a lot. So I've been eating a little bit, but an egg yolk is really oleic acid. It's more, it's not even that really high in saturated fat. So, and eating a lot of smaller fish, you know, is something that I do too. I know as a vegetarian, you probably don't eat that, but I do like sardines and, you know, oysters and mackerel and things like that. And I've replaced some of my meat with more fish and, uh, and I don't even think I had any meat today yet, but usually like at dinner, we'll do like some kind of meat or fish or something like that. But I've had like eggs throughout the day, <laughs> more eggs. So we have free range chickens and stuff running around. So that's amazing. Where, where is your that. farm? <laughs> uh, we're in the middle. We're in like Plant City, Florida. And uh, yeah, we have like eight cows and they're just, it's kind of like a hobby farm, but it's kind of growing into and we have like a, a pond, which was a fish farm. So I'm renovating it and I want to do like more of a regenerative farm. It's like my retirement project. I've been working on that. So that's awesome. <laughs> that's what I do uh, before I, yeah, no, before I dive into some other questions that more common mm -hmm. questions people have on uh, ketogenic diets, one question before I forget, uh, the beta hydroxy butyrate supplement you mentioned, do you just take that without food in the mornings? Yeah, I, my routine is like wake up, drink a big glass of water, and then I get my coffee <laughs> brewing. Uh, I'm a big fan of coffee too, but I don't go too overboard with it. And then I uh, I mix like a, a third of a packet of keto start with some uh, like three grams of creatine monohydrate. 
which is a good supplement for strength and some acetyl L-carnitine. And then I mix that up and it tastes really good. And then I drink that and then I take the dogs out, let the cows out, walk around barefoot, get some sun, get some sunshine, you know, and then, you know, for 15 minutes or so come back in, get my coffee. And then I, I put, uh, without eating anything. And then I put something in my coffee called keto brains, which is MCT oil powder. It's got lion's mane, alpha GPC and uh, theanine in it. So theanine is sort of a, a GABA based, you know, amino acid. So, and then w mixed with the coffee, it's good. It takes like the jitters away from caffeine and you're very focused. And then on days where I need to get a lot done, I just have that little spike of ketones with the electrolytes and then the creatine. And then I come in and I have my coffee and then I can just bang out a lot of work for like four to six hours. Right. And then sometimes then I'll eat my first meal. Or I'll come in, you know, I'll have my coffee and then I'll cook breakfast. And uh, lately I've been eating more breakfast, you know, and I just do intermittent fasting maybe once or twice a week, something like that. But I like to sit down with my wife and have breakfast and have dinner. Uh, and for breakfast, I'll have, you know, uh, actually I've been making these waffles, which are like <laughs> uh, <laughs> eggs. And I just mix some eggs and like mozzarella cheese together into a batter and put it in this little convenient waffle maker and you just pour it in and it just magically makes these waffles. And I've been kind of eating, eating them. And, um, uh, but yeah, I'm okay. The things when you are adapted, when you're fat adapted and you follow a ketogenic diet for a period of time, or if you just do intermittent fasting, when you're fasting, it doesn't become a crisis if you go without food. So I think that's, that's a significant advantage to being fat adapted. Uh, but I do experience really good benefits with a ketone supplement. So I'll, I'll add that. And I think the science is very nascent, but I think, you know, there's like 50 clinical trials already, which surprised me on ketone supplements. And uh, I think, I think there's a lot of potential in, in these compounds. I think there's a lot of work that we need to do to develop the optimal formulation because the current ketone salts that are on the market I, they have questionable purity, they have questionable mm -hmm. potency, and they have very questionable tolerability that you drink them and then you have to run to the bathroom. <laughs> they have, they have, so that's why the Keto Start product has like an electrolyte array similar to another product that I really like called Element. It's L-M-N-T. It's like mm -hmm. an electrolyte. So Rob Wolf makes it. And then the electrolyte blend is very much the same but the electrolytes are bound to ketones. So you're delivering the electrolytes and delivering ketones, beta hydroxybutyrate at a pretty high concentration. And uh, like, I don't take a whole pack, it's just a third of a pack, I feel it. And then I do the other two thirds later on in the afternoon. So that has become one of my staple supplements. And, uh, but I used to take tons of different supplements, but now I've narrowed it down to vitamin D, you know, maybe magnesium at night, um, and then melatonin. I do think there's a lot of benefits to melatonin for sleep. I did melatonin as a postdoctoral fellow where uh, I put it into solution with hippocampal brain slices and I saw that it decreased oxygen free radicals and basically kept the hippocampus very healthy under conditions that would otherwise kill the neurons. So that made me kind of a believer in this when you do the research. And I think uh, it's a very good antioxidant. So I don't take it necessarily as a sleep supplement, although I take it during the day. I'm also in touch with patients that are using like one to two grams of melatonin, not, not milligrams, like grams of melatonin for an anti-cancer effect. So these are cancer patients who more or less are effectively managing their cancer and their melatonin at a high dose has anti-cancer effects and uh, some other interesting properties. So, and they're not sleepy. So one of the things I actually say it has like a serotonin effect. They feel happy. They feel good. I think you're well past <laughs> the dosage. You're saturating the receptors and everything, but they became, because I never heard of people taking such a oh, high these dose. These are cancer patients. These are cancer patients. Yeah, there's groups of cancer patients and they, you know, they send me papers and I was reading the papers and I was like, there's pretty good scientific rationale for the anti-cancer effects of melatonin. Hmm. So, you know, I, I 
communicated with them. I was like, well, how do you feel? And they said, well, uh, and these are a couple now. So first, and one patient in particular that I talk to quite often uh, actually goes by the name of Naples Dave. So you can look him up on Instagram and check him out because he has, a, you know, his prognosis was not very good. And he's pr pretty, he's a, effectively managing his cancer uh, with ketogenic diet, fasting, and incorporating also the standard of care. Uh, and actually he used exogenous ketones too, which is kind of interesting. Uh, but I, I know his doctor at the Moffitt Cancer Center and it's, it's a remarkable case. And I think it's actually worthy of maybe a case report. So, uh, so yeah, and then, you know, there's just people that are taking mega dosing melatonin. It's something, it's a supplement that I've used since graduate school. So 25 years I've been using it and I don't see any negative effects from it. And I think there's good health benefits and brain longevity benefits to using melatonin. You should uh, talk to Dr. Sachin Panda about it, if I remember correctly. I believe I heard I him say that he is not a huge fan of it because it disrupts your circadian rhythm and also leads to, I think, glucose spikes. So yeah, I'm not sure about that. Mm, we talked about it a little bit. I brought it up in a recent interview that I did mm -hmm. with him. I'm not sure if they posted it yet on... Uh, on the YouTube page, but uh, so he was mostly not a fan of melatonin because of the potential for circadian disruption. Right. So if the, and you know, and the, the, and he's very right that the dose of melatonin is like five or 10 milligrams now where it should really be like 500 micrograms. But on conversely, you have people taking a thousand milligram or 5,000 milligram, you're taking gram, like, you know, getting the raw powder and scooping it and they're feeling great. All their biomarkers are great. And then, you know, I don't, I'm mostly interested in melatonin, not affected to circadian and they're sleeping great too, from my understanding. But my interest in melatonin is as a neuroprotective antioxidant compound that crosses the blood brain barrier and gets into the mitochondria and into the brain. I think it has remarkable effects. Uh, there and the anti-cancer effects too, uh, so in particular for breast cancer and stuff. So mm -hmm. I'm actually pushing my wife to, you know, take it more prophylactically, uh, but she's not, doesn't want to take any kind of pills, you know, she's, and I, I agree with her. I think the most important thing to do for sleep and circadian is to get out in the sun early in the morning, get, you know, bright light in your face. And, uh, but you don't want to overdo sun too, but I'm, I have, I'm a big fan of the sun. We live in Florida. So I try to get it early in the morning and just, I kind of do work during the day, but I keep my, my office, you know, keep a window right by my desk. I think that's important. Okay. So what about ketogenic diet for women? Cause I think some people are a little iffy about it, especially I know personally for me, especially before I start my menstrual cycle, I have way more carb craving. So it's much harder mm -hmm. for me to practice it back then. Uh, but in general, like, is there data that it affects the two sexes, men and women differently? Yeah, I think the suppression of the hormone insulin can alter female physiology in ways that males don't experience. <laughs> and one thing, I mean, in women that are lactating, if they become totally unable to you know, breastfeed if they're on a low carb ketogenic diet. So they have to incorporate carbs. So I know personally mm -hmm. some, some females like that. Um, and if you look at the only really good data we have with female solid data, we have females with it, our true ketogenic diet is in the world of epilepsy. And in that case, some adolescent females become amenorrheic. And so there's like, I think the data was a five times higher chance of getting amenorrhea. But if you really look at the data, it appeared that it was the protein restriction too was part of that. So maybe a more modified diet, uh, modified Atkins type diet and higher protein, and that would have not been the case. Uh, so I do think that females, if they do follow a ketogenic diet, it's probably more important for them to get adequate protein, like 20% of their diet to protein and not like 10% protein or not like not a clinical ketogenic diet. So to, to ensure that they get the, the problem with females that I've communicated with over the years is that they start a ketogenic diet, they start an exercise program, and then they'd like intermittent fast at the same time. So it's like they're doing all these interventions 
So the combination of carbohydrate restriction, very low insulin, over-exercising with calorie restriction, their hormones go through the floor, they stop menstruating, they're over-exercising. So I think this is largely a result of a calorie deficit and, you know, mm. which is exercising will produce more of a calorie deficit. And, but if you get sufficient amount of calories, sufficient amount of protein, and you're not overtraining, uh, I see little chance of any hormonal effects, unless you're doing like a very regimented clinical ketogenic diet, um, could be a possibility for that, but you don't know unless you test. So I think it's it's more important for women to do just an overall hormone profile. Look at thyroid, look at LH, FSH, you know, look at, you know, do a hormone profile, uh, maybe more important for women. But I, I look at my hormones. I do salivary hormones and blood hormones and, you know, everything's pretty much normal. Uh, my DHEA was trending a little bit low. So, so I actually, I do take, I don't do like testosterone replacement therapy or anything like that, but I do take a dose of DHEA first thing in the morning. So that's, yeah, that's another supplement that I take. And then that seems to, that definitely brought my DHEA up and everything else is like, you know, within the, uh, a good range. So, uh, and I'm not getting, not super young. So, uh, <laughs> so things I know, <laughs> Many, I know just many people, guys, especially in the fitness world that are on hormone replacement therapy, testosterone, and they're like in their thirties and forties. So I don't want to go that route for a long time. So I think, uh, I get a lot of questions about the ketogenic diet, increasing testosterone, decreasing testosterone. I don't, I, it didn't really have any effect on me as long. I know that fasting will decrease my time. And that's why I capped my fasting to three mm -hmm. days when I did five days or seven days, definitely suppressed my hormones. So. And it took, took some time for it to recover. So, but with three days seems to be the sweet spot. I can get deep into ketosis, probably get a lot of the benefits without disrupting my, my hormones. And what about pregnant women? Is it safe for them to be on a ketogenic diet? <laughs> yeah, I definitely would not go out on a limb and say, Hey, it's fine. But, uh, but conversely, I've been in contact with, a number of women who contacted me and said, you know, I went full term. I was in a state of high ketones the whole time. I don't think it's optimal. I think the growing fetus, you know, probably it's good to do a mixed diet. A you know, some women gain too much weight, you know, during pregnancy. So I think one way to moderate that weight gain is simply to, you know, restrict your carbohydrates. But I think a lower carb, maybe moderate protein, moderate fat diet, just a mixed diet, you know, eliminate process. But I think you need to be very much more cautious about what you're eating when you're pregnant, because the developing fetus is very sensitive to environmental toxins. So, you know, you probably don't want to be eating, you know, fish every day. So, but then again, things like I, I eat a lot of sardines and joe rogan told me that he was eating sardines and his arsenic was off the right. track so immediately i come home and i was like okay i did the hair test i did blood test so everything was within normal range uh mercury arsenic all that stuff uh was in normal range and if anything i was eating massive amounts of fish during that time like eating traveling lots of sardines and things like that so if there was heavy metals or other contaminant in my fish it would have showed up on there. Although when I was um, in grad school, I was eating those big cans of tuna that you get from Sam's and, you know, and I think maybe I was getting some effects. I was losing more hair, but maybe my testosterone, but I, I saw some effects. And one of my professors was like, I don't, it wasn't, I didn't take it as, you know, uh, a critique, but she was like, Hey, you're, lo you're eating a lot of tuna and you tend to be losing some hair there. And she's like, I had a friend that was, you know, eating, eating a lot of swordfish and things. And then, and she started, it was a female, she started losing her hair. And I was like, Oh, that's kind of interesting. And then I like started eating more salmon, I think at the time or whatever. But looking back, I was eating way too much tuna fish. I was eating, I was on a super high protein diet. And I think maybe I was maybe getting some signs of mercury toxicity looking back, but I never knew to measure back then. You know, I, Does never, that I wasn't cause into hair measuring. Loss? Is mercury toxicity connected to hair loss? Well, 
it, it, it can be, I think, under some circumstances. But uh, you know, she sent me some papers on it or something like that. But uh, but I, I'm not totally convinced. But I think the important thing is, like, you know, the question was about pregnancy, and I think you need to be much more cautious about the quality of your food when you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding. I know I would be like having studied like developmental biology and neurobiology and things like that. Uh, like we live on a farm, you know, it was, there's like lots of glyphosate being used, which is Roundup and other chemicals and things like that. And when we, you know, we bought the place, started looking through all the chemicals and thinking, wow, you know, I would be very, if, you know, my wife was pregnant or something and I would be very cautious and very concerned uh, about living on a farm. And I grew up on farms spraying, you know, chemicals and things like that. And looking back, um, I would be very cautious in with, with females that are pregnant in that sort of situation. So, uh, but I don't see any particular concerns with a ketogenic diet. If that's, uh, but I don't think it's ideal. I don't think there's like serious safety concerns. I would not advise it, but I would advise maybe a lower carbohydrate diet if you have a propensity to gain weight, you know, during pregnancy. It's one way to moderate it. Mm -hmm. And what about children? Do you think they need higher carbs or can they be on a modified keto, low carb diet? Well, we have a obesity problem with children <laughs> now. <laughs> so I think the biggest thing to target is calorie containing liquids like high fructose corn syrup sodas and things like that. So that's like the low hanging fruit that we need to eliminate, but processed carbs are a big problem. Uh, low, you know, lower carb diets, I think are, can be very beneficial for kids that have like HD, ADHD and attention deficit disorder and things like that. I know that because I've communicated with quite a few parents and some of them even sending me videos before and after of their behavior, their kids, some of them sending report cards showing like, you know, their scores are higher mm -hmm. after doing what they're calling a ketogenic diet. But when I find out what they're really eating, it's more just like, like no sugar, no processed carbs, just, you know, lower carb and not necessarily ketogenic. And in the world of epilepsy too, like uh, cognitive function increases with, you know, if you're not having seizures, you tend to <laughs> have better behavior, better learning and memory and things like that. So uh, in the world of epilepsy, we know that kids do well on a ketogenic diet and, uh, and they tend to do better cognitively too. And I believe Whether that translates to, you know, normal, healthy kids, mm -hmm. Probably not, but for kids that have the beginning of obesity, and we have kids now with non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and you know they would be good candidates, I think, for uh, if not a ketogenic diet, just a lower carb diet. Which which makes me think: Do you think uh, there's a genetic component to it as well? Like people respond differently to ketogenic diets based on their their, their genes. Yeah, uh, I collaborated with uh, Lucia Ironica on a, on a review article, and uh, Dr. Jeff Volick was on it too, that people can have a variety of different SNPs where they have impaired fatty acid oxidation enzymes and even like ketolytic enzymes and, and things that would make them more susceptible to a higher fat intake. So there are definitely people that I've communicated with that had fat intolerance that felt sick on a ketogenic diet. They got hypoglycemic. They could not, they're few and far between, but I think most people, if they give it time, can adapt to a ketogenic diet. But for some people, you know, it's hard to put a number to it, 10, 50%. They just, they almost have a violent response to the mm -hmm. higher fat. So with our study we're doing now, Dr. Allison Hall at Florida Medical Clinic is sort of the the clinician running the study, what she does, and she's learned through, you know, a vast amount of experience is to transition a person to a ketogenic diet over like four to six weeks. You know, if they're at two, 300 grams of carbs, you bring them down to a hundred and then, you know, gradually to eight to, you know, to 75, you know, 50, 25. Uh, and then you titrate it depending upon the individual to achieve an elevation of ketones. And then that, that's a little bit different for each, each patient, but, uh, but that, that's the best way to do it to 
ensure adaptation to prevent side effects. And also if they have a bad experience out of the gate, they're likely not going to follow through with the 12 week, you know, intervention that we have. So, uh, or sustain the diet to produce that sustained weight loss, which is really producing the beneficial effects of weight loss. That's a good point. When I initially started the ketogenic diet, it was actually during COVID. Um, and I completely cut out my carbs and I, the, the, the next day I woke up and I thought I was dying. I felt so sick, uh, but I eventually yeah. adapted and it was fine. Yeah. Yeah. The same happens with like intermittent fasting. So you can kind of uh, enhance that metabolic switching, which is a term uh, Dr. Mark Matson uses, the metabolic switch. So uh, one way to help you adapt to a ketogenic diet is to do like low carb intermittent fasting and then gradually titrate your carbohydrates down. And, and I think it could be not completely painless, but it can be uh, much more tolerable for most people to do it in that way, a more gradual way. I didn't do it that way. I just went right straight right into like, I got Dr. Freeman and Dr. Kossoff's <laughs> book and was like, I bought the scale at the time, I bought these blood, the blood ketone meter, which was like really crazy expensive at the time. Uh, I forget the name of the company, but it was like, you know, I went full steam into it and kind of got sick and lost a lot of strength. And, but, you know, after about three or four weeks, I was like, oh, okay, I see what you're talking about. Like I started feeling the benefits and then I didn't get hungry. And that was very odd for me. It was very much into food to not be hungry. It was, it was kind of, little strange <laughs> to not be hungry all the time. Then I realized, oh, I'm going into a tenure track faculty position. And if I can not be hungry, I can get more work done and I can, you know, not have to be, you know, I can leverage it to my advantage. And I was reading so much about ketones. I was really believing like, wow, if I get my ketones elevated, then I'll just be much more productive and happy overall. So I think a lot of the benefits that I talk about with being in ketosis came as a result of the belief <laughs> that ketones were magical and that they're going to do. And I think to some extent they are. And I think that's why I take small amounts of exogenous ketones because they do offer real world benefits. But I think a lot of my initial enthusiasm and you know advocacy of this was just through just being very compelled by the science. And this was Dr. Richard Veach at the time, Dr. George Cahill, who did research on like fasting, Dr. Mark Matson, I think he had published that beta hydroxybutyrate was enhancing learning and memory because it was like, it was the molecule that when you fast, beta hydroxybutyrate goes up and that works through BDNF to enhance long-term potentiation and memory and things like that. So I was reading all these papers and doing the diet and, um, you know, <laughs> experiencing these benefits. And I think uh, half of my enthusiasm for this was, I was very excited to be able to, you know, to be in a faculty position, to do what I love and to make this part of my, you know, academic research program. <laughs> that was part of it too. And I had students that it's much better when you have students that are sincerely enthusiastic and interested in what you're doing, you know, and, and instead of studying like a drug or some kind of esoteric pathway with a diet, once you get results, it's like it has like real world applicability. So you can talk about it and like people get interested in it okay. as opposed to like, you know, some weird drug affecting KRAS for like cancer or something like that. So, but we do drug research. We do metformin research. And I know you had uh, a Dr. person Nicholas on talking about right. Yeah, I have, you know, uh, a student of mine did his whole project just on metformin. And, and yeah, you know, so we do drug research, too. It's just most of what we do is ketogenic interventions. What was the research on metformin? Yeah, so we looked at the mechanism of metformin. So metformin does suppress cancer, like in our, so we looked at, you know, AMP kinase, but mostly uh, what we discovered is that metformin is working through complex one of the mitochondria. And it actually functions as like uh, a weak mitochondrial toxin. <laughs> so it actually increases reactive oxygen species and that may contribute to, you know, maybe some of the anti-cancer effects, but it has, uh, 
through the through the mitochondrial electron transport chain, <laughs> it has sort of a a weak mitochondrial toxicity associated with that that is associated with some of the anti-cancer effects that we saw in the lab. And maybe I I was interested in melatonin. I mean, I was interested in metformin as a longevity drug. And, you know, our discovery was that it was sort of functioning as a mild mitochondrial toxin in a way. Um, and, and I, you know, no doubt that it activates AMP kinase too. And we didn't see a very big, I was very interested to see a reduction in glucose. We didn't really see that in the mice. There was a trend towards it, but it wasn't really that significant. Uh, and I think if you, if you have really high glucose, metformin can bring it down by enhancing insulin sensitivity, maybe through AMP kinase. But the main effect that we saw that it was kind of working to increase you know, mitochondrial ox reactive oxygen species. And it was kind of working through this mechanism. So when you did the experiments on metformin, was it that metformin was given to mice who had cancer mm -hmm. or just given to both groups and some, the mice that had metformin didn't develop cancer versus uh, the others did? Yeah, we used the VMM3 model of metastatic cancer and it decreased, um, you know, tumor burden over time. So it gave the mice like a little bit of a longevity advantage. And we also looked at another drug called uh, DCA, dichloroacetate, which activates PDH. And, uh, you know, we're pretty enthusiastic that that was going to produce an effect too, based upon some literature. But I think it had like little or no effect on our model. It was a pretty mild effect, whereas metformin had a pretty nice effect on it. And we didn't, we didn't like couple metformin with other interventions. We, I think maybe I wanted my student to at the time, but he was mostly interested in drugs and not so much the diet. So we just did metformin with a standard diet and it, and it had an effect similar to a modified ketogenic diet. Not, not quite as much, but, um, and, and we never did a study where we like combined like metformin ketone supplementation, ketogenic diet, hyperbaric oxygen. Like I, I wanted to, cause you know, some patients are doing this too and uh, it would be nice to do that. But I think if you throw too many things in, you don't know what's working, but we have kind of already studied each thing individually. So I think it would be nice to go back and combine like 2-deoxyglucose, ketogenic diet, metformin, hyperbaric oxygen therapy. One of my students did vitamin C uh, for her uh, undergraduate uh, honors thesis, which was pretty nice data. Then she went to Oxford and did a master's there. And now she's at the Moffitt Cancer Center, just right across the street, doing some some nice work. But I, I kind of wanted her to come and do her PhD on vitamin C. So maybe I'll revisit that project too. And because uh, intravenous vitamin C, very interesting to me because vitamin C in millimolar concentrations becomes a prooxidant. So you can drive the Fenton reaction and actually, you know, enhance oxidative stress in tumors by delivering. Vitamin C also uses the same uh, transporter as glucose. So it becomes a glucose antagonist. If you get mm -hmm. vitamin C up very high, it blocks glucose transport. And that can be, be beneficial to, to cancer cells that are need a high amount of glucose. So um, yeah, so it, it, we are very interested in combining many of these approaches to develop a comprehensive, non-toxic, metabolic-based therapy for cancer. I mean, this is sort of a big motivation uh, of myself and the entire lab. Many people come to my lab because they're very interested in testing these uh, uh, drug therapies like metformin, DCA, 2-deoxyglucose, but also like these these dietary therapies too, and more integrative. Uh, I don't like to use the word alternative, but integrative approaches like IV vitamin C. And you know, I had a student that was interested in EGCG and turmeric and curcumin, and I think there's there's uh, a rationale for looking at these things too. And we we want to do that. We want to start looking at these compounds. I wonder if a lot of these compounds, say metformin, for example, have benefits once you already have cancer versus actually preventing cancer. Like if you, if, if I'm just a healthy person, I'm not 
is is there any data that metformin can prevent cancer versus like if I have cancer that maybe it will suppress the tumor a little more? Yeah, some of the most compelling data came out on people with type 2 diabetes. So if you have type 2 diabetes and you were using metformin over the for a protracted period of time, if you go back retrospectively and look at the data, in particular, I remember uh, pancreatic cancer, something like 60%, you know, decrease in the likelihood of getting pancreatic cancer in if you have type 2 diabetes, you know, you are at a much higher risk of getting uh, like liver cancer, gallbladder cancer, pancreatic cancer for women, endometrial cancer, I think, you know, uh, stomach cancer, things like that. So, but in, in type 2 diabetic patients that were using metformin, their likelihood of getting pancreatic cancer was significantly reduced. It was more than 50%, I think maybe like 60%. So, um, so that data, I remember that was some of the data that got me interested in actually studying metformin and, uh, and other compounds. So I think 2-deoxyglucose, 3-bromopyruvate, which inhibits hexokinase 2 is something very interesting, although the whole story behind that's a little bit, uh, <laughs> there's an interesting story behind that. And Dr. Dr. Ko at Johns Hopkins did a lot of Spearhead a lot of very interesting research behind that. And it's a molecule that needs to be delivered in a very precise way to avert the liver toxicity that could be associated with that. But it's a very powerful anti-cancer therapy that if we harness that and maybe couple it with other other modalities, it could be very effective. Hmm. Okay. Well, a couple of last questions on ketogenic diets. Um, what is the connection between ketogenic diets and helping with Alzheimer's disease, or even with people who have uh, an APOE4 carrier? Good question. Uh, so there was some research showing that MCT oil, it was a compound that Xera made, it was called AC1202, that actually kind of got me interested in MCTs. Then this compound was used in, a, in some subjects that had mild cognitive impairment or early al al Alzheimer's disease, onset Alzheimer's disease. And the, the, the benefit was dependent upon the elevation of ketones, but not in subjects that were a, APOE4 positive, right? So, mm. uh, so the APO, APO E4 positive subjects were, but it was a very small trial. But I think later, I think in a bigger study, if you were to look at this, I don't think that would be the case. So um, I'm kind of going out on a limb on that. But I think there was work, uh, a number of studies that have been done by different investigators, including Dr. Stephen Kunin, you might want to have him on. Uh, he did studies looking at brain energy metabolism, looking at you know, a glucose PET scan and then a ketone PET scan. And for subjects that had mild cognitive impairment over time, you see glucose hypometabolism is a hallmark characteristic of Alzheimer's disease or even cognitive impairment. So it's been termed type three diabetes by some. So this is generally accepted and it's not really known why. Does the the metabolic impairment lead to the, the, you know, formation of the amyloid and tau plaques over time. Is it the, what came first, the chicken or the egg kind of scenario, right? So uh, I do think with Alzheimer's disease, there's a metabolic phenotype, uh, meaning that for people who have Alzheimer's disease and have this metabolic phenotype, they are very responsive to a metabolic intervention, meaning, you know, an, eleva an elevation of ketone bodies delivered with a ketogenic diet or a ketone ester can produce remarkable improvements in cognitive function, reaction time, brain energy metabolism, that sort of thing. So I would say that Steve Newport, who is the husband of Dr. Mary Newport, she wrote a book about Alzheimer's disease and ketones and really highlighting the work of the late Dr. Richard Veach, who developed one of the first ketone esters 
which was actually used in a case report that was published and he was the subject of that. And I had the opportunity to meet, you know, Steve Newport when he was still alive and with Mary and I, I witnessed him consume MCT oil and he became more animated. His tremors stopped. He was starting to get tremors at the time. He had pretty advanced Alzheimer's disease at the time. So this was like 2008 or nine. And it was, it was one of the things that actually motivated me at a very gut level that this is something, you know, this person had, was not speaking and he had tremors. He just consumed this oil that was in a little vial. And in 15 minutes, he became talkative and his, and his uh, tremors stopped. So, and he was not really following, he was doing a low carb diet, but he was not really on a ketogenic diet. So what he consumed was coconut oil and MCT oil. It's like 30 or 40 milliliters. And I remember this because Dr. Mary Newport came to me and she was a guest speaker at the College of Aging for this class I was teaching. So I invited her, I was like, hey, do you wanna speak too about your observations? And then we went out to eat. And then I witnessed this and then I started reading more and talking with her. And this actually influenced the trajectory of my career. <laughs> and I started, I became more interested in studying ketogenic diet, not only for seizures, but we actually got a project started up at the Bird Alzheimer's Center at University of South Florida, which was funded by the Alzheimer's Association. It was a mouse study and they also funded a human clinical trial with coconut oil and MCT oil, but it was hard to recruit subjects for that trial because they realized that they could just go to the nutrition store and buy MCT oil or coconut oil <laughs> and not have the problem of, of uh, having a placebo, you know? Right. And it was like, well, if it's if working, you know, the subjects don't want to be consuming a placebo. They could just go, it wasn't like a drug, you know, they could go to the store. So it was difficult to recruit for that trial. I feel like the center really didn't market and try to recruit for it. So I don't know. That's another whole story. There was, there's kind of a big push for drug research, but, um, but long story short. Yeah. So uh, with Alzheimer's disease, I do think that many people uh, glucose hypometabolism is a hallmark and quite a few patients will respond positively to a metabolic intervention and if you are APOE4 positive, the important thing is a ketogenic diet may not be totally optimal. I think a low carb diet that's rich in phytonutrients, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of coffee, green tea, turmeric, kale, parsley, cocoa, you know, walnuts, all these things, you know, and, and some of these things are not ketogenic, but having a good balanced, healthy diet, and then with ketone supplementation and omega-3s and maybe some supplements like alpha GPC and, you know, uh, uh, different brain boosting nootropic supplements may offer some advantage too. So uh, even different mushroom compounds like uh, lion's mane uh, could be helpful. Uh, there's a company called uh, First Person that I'm a big fan of and they create different uh, mushroom based compounds that are kind of nootropic too. And I think, I think there's a, a lot of emerging evidence for some of these compounds too. And, and you think these could be preventative as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think the science is not there yet, but I do think that uh, anything that keeps your heart and metabolic health, you know, optimized is going to help your brain. So we know that. So blood pressure, glucose, you know, inflammation, like, you know, focus on that. And then your brain, it'll pay big dividends for your brain later on. But and then physical exercise, but also training your brain, like actually doing mental exercises, reading and not talked about much, but social engagement, you know, actually building healthy relationships, social interaction, things like that. My wife's a big fan of dancing and she thinks that like, <laughs> you know, we have friends that have a, a tango studio and they actually observed that Parkinson's disease patients when put in that atmosphere and they dance, it's like very therapeutic. And it's like, so that's oh, a wow. whole interesting area of research. So you have music, which is like cognitive stimulation and it 
like changes your whole state, elevates dopamine. And then you're dancing, which is physical movement. And then you have social interaction and stuff too. And the more I think about it, the more I was like, let's design a study where we give people ketones and then they can dance and do these complicated dance routines to music. And then you have social interaction. So I'm thinking, <laughs> like, there's something That would something be cool. Here. I, yeah. I had this idea a few years ago as well, where, you know, what if we did uh, combine, say, exercise with music and maybe some sort of social interaction for just mental health or mental disorders or even mild forms of depression, I honestly think it could have such a good effect instead of taking medication for a lot of people. Yeah, I'm totally a fan of doing all that and even doing it like outside in the sun right. with animals. So <laughs> animals, like we have <laughs> Basically cows. Basically come and to your like, farm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> We have, uh, we have, we have Brahmin cows, which are like the best cows, right? And so it's like the holy cow. Yeah and, yeah. and these are like amazing animals that you don't do any, you just give them a nice field with grass and treat them well, but we have them trained. So they're just like pets. And uh, for my wife, it's very therapeutic for her. And I, I, I'll have to say that I could take a break during work and go out and just hang out with the cows and it's very calming. So they're just amazing animals. So yeah, I think there's a lot of under utilized resources and ideas that I think we can implement for brain health and therapies for people. Yeah. Um, one last question, keto and exercise. I mean, you clearly, uh, you, I think lift a lot, you exercise a lot. You mentioned, I know once you've mentioned you did like a 500 pound deadlift after seven days of fasting. Um, so oh, it's yeah. clearly it's possible, <laughs> but is it, um, optimal for people to be on a ketogenic diet when they are exercising heavily or, or, or is yeah well uh, so i guess the question stated another way is the ketogenic diet optimal for exercise performance and gaining muscle mm -hmm. i would say no but if you're if you want to enhance body composition in regards to maximum fat loss and muscle retention, I would say that a modified ketogenic diet is probably superior for some people. <laughs> so to get around your question, not to be like, try to avert the question, but I think for a large majority of people who are, many people exercise to lose weight, right? So I think you'll have more favorable body composition alterations with exercise if you do a modified form of a ketogenic diet. You'll just get results faster. And I don't, if your protein is adequate and sufficient, you're not going to risk muscle loss if you get your protein in. And you don't have to go crazy with protein, but I think you do need to get it up to a certain level about, you know, 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilogram to really keep your muscle on. And, uh, you know, if, if you're vegetarian, that's not hard. If you can get eggs in, if you're vegan, if you want to, you know, that that's another whole thing. And that's, uh, you really need to think about combining, you know, different plant sources, but we do have plant, plant proteins on the market that could be helpful for that. Um, yeah. didn't mean to go down like the whole plant based thing, but, uh, but I do think a ketogenic diet, uh, can be used and whether it's optimal, I'm in contact with uh, professional athletes, you know, that are using this from football players to, you know, hockey players and baseball players and things like that, that are using a ketogenic diet. So I know it's, I know it's possible to how be a very does it, high level. Yeah. But how long does it take your body to adapt to it? Cause I know from just my personal experience, when I initially started the ketogenic diet, it took me maybe at least two months or so to get back, get my performance back to where I was before the ketogenic diet. So can athletes afford it if it, if it, if there's an adaptation period? Yeah, that's the feedback is about two or three months, but I tell you, I think, you know, over the course of a year, you're still getting adaptations and oh, right, the right, more right. you do it and the more you follow it, the, the more the more benefits you'll derive and the more adaptations mm -hmm. that you'll get from it. So I think, you know, you kind of like many things in life, you get out of it, what you put into it. And the more 
time and effort. And there's a learning curve to doing the diet and tracking it and ensuring that you're actually in ketosis. I know there was for me and I felt like I know more than most people about it, but there was still quite a bit of a learning curve to do it right. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. All right. Um, what else? Uh, questions that I haven't covered asked you other areas of research that you're excited about. I know we covered a few that your lab's, lab is exploring, but maybe something else we haven't touched upon and you're, you're quite excited about. Yeah, you know, I'm very interested in this idea of, of an endogenous metabolite, beta-hydroxybutyrate or maybe acetoacetate too, being a, being a therapeutic and being able to consume this as a supplement or a compound that can dose dependently elevate this endogenous metabolite to trigger signaling effects that could be anti inflammatory processes or what we're really focusing on now is like neuro regenerative neuroprotective things and epigenetic things so we're looking at epigenetic pathways so we're in the process of now of you know developing methods for histone extraction you know uh looking at uh histone modifications looking at you know, re-regulating histone modifications, improving gene expression patterns, increasing double cortin and neurogenesis, like we have animal models where we're looking at that. So, um, and then, you know, we're doing behavioral studies where we're looking at increasing and enhancing learning capacity, you mm -hmm. know, uh, learning and memory, but also improving like behavior, like uh, anxiety behaviors and things like that and reversing that. So I'm pretty excited about that. And also the expanding field of metabolic psychiatry. So before we go into our metabolic health summit, which is coming up in about a month, we have a, a, a conference that's happening just prior to that with some key investigators that are studying the effects of ketogenic diet on psychiatric conditions. And it includes like depression, anxiety, and bipolar disorder, where the ketogenic diet appears to be very uh, efficacious in helping patients. So this had been reported and actually being studied by a number of key people. Uh, one of them is from Stanford uh, that Dr. Uh, Shabani will be from Stanford is, is kind of investigating this and several NIH funded investigators will be uh, uh, coming together to talk about this. So I'm very excited about the, the future of nutrition as uh, a metabolic intervention that can help with psychiatric disorders too. What's interesting in the case of like bipolar disorder is that the go-to treatments are actually anti-seizure drugs. <laughs> Many anti-seizure drugs are actually used as medication to help manage the manic phase of bipolar disorder. So it kind of makes sense that, you know, the ketogenic therapies can help to manage patients uh, that have bipolar. And Dr. Chris Palmer was a speaker. Uh, at our event and this will be a speaker uh, this year too. And he's at Harvard and he's had a number of patients that he has helped. And I became aware of his work and I think I would like to bring more attention to this uh, idea of improving uh, mental health and, and actually treating psychiatric conditions with, with a ketogenic diet. Oh, that's, that actually is a really exciting idea and field. Cause I, I wonder if it's, if it's just, so many things happening, right? Maybe your brain is just calmer, but also maybe if you're just cutting out the processed food and sugar, you might just feel better. You're more active. I that's I I, I do hope, yeah, it becomes. It's more part of it. Prevalent. I mean, we know from epilepsy that you're changing the neuropharmacology of your brain. Whether dopamine and serotonin are involved, I don't know. We haven't looked into that, but adenosine. Uh, is definitely elevated like two or threefold higher and then GABA to glutamate ratio. GABA is significantly elevated relative to glutamate. So I think GABA can have a calming effect, you know, anxiolytic effect. Uh, this is this is like without question we see that. I measured my own neurotransmitters and saw that too. I wanted to make sure our mouse data was uh, was happening in myself too. Uh, so 
so yeah, I, I think that's kind of on the horizon and it's, it's an area of research that I'm very excited to be part of, uh, the use of nutrition uh, to impact metabolic psychiatry. This whole field, I think, will advance quite a bit in the next couple of years. And uh, this just I just thought of this, and maybe there's no study or you don't know about this, but could you maybe combine, say, psychedelic research with uh, ketogenic research and ketogenic endogenous, ex exogenous ketones? Like, Do you think that would help as well? Yeah, you know, I'm... I, in the past, I'm kind of hesitant to talk about psychedelic research, but the more I connect with people that are using some of these, you know, mushroom compounds, the more I'm starting to get very interested in it. And I would encourage people to go to the website first person and they're developing for right now. It's like compounds that can be used as nootropic from lion's mane to reishi to shaga and, you know, different things, cordyceps, mushrooms. Uh, but I know they're working to advance this idea of developing a particular strain of psilocybin for microdosing and then microdosing compounds for mental health, for depression, for anxiety. The, the people behind it actually brought to my attention, they had a father that their father was uh, suffering from Alzheimer's disease. And in the later stages, they had given him... Uh, I, I hope it's okay to make this public, but they had given him some psilocybin and they saw remarkable effects. He became animated. He could do things that he otherwise couldn't do. And I thought, well, that's that information should get out. And I think that motivated them to sort of start the company. I think initially it was called Leo Wellness, but now it's first person. Uh, I think it's like they're, it's like get first person, maybe the, the website, but if you Google search it, you'll find it. And they have developed some very interesting formulations uh, that can be consumed in the morning to enhance like dopamine in the later, you know, mid part of the day for serotonin, then at nighttime to help, you know, with sleeping or calming you down. And then I know they are working to advance this idea of developing a microdose formulation that can be used by the general public, but would have major implications for getting people off some of the SSRIs and other drugs that are often prescribed or overprescribed. Uh, I do think this is a very rich area of research. I was generally hesitant to get involved with some of these companies, but then I saw the NIH was sponsoring workshops and encouraging investigators to actually do this kind of research. It's like, you know, my university would like steer professors away from anything like CBD related and then then it was like, then they're sending emails to be like, you should be submitting grants to, <laughs> to do CBD research. <laughs> so it's like, you know, the attitudes have changed over time. And I think that we're getting to a point where academic universities will start encouraging their faculty to sort of get involved in this research if federal dollars become available. Of course, it's usually how it works. Um, and I'm excited to get into this research just because I've communicated with people that have used these uh, natural compounds that, you know, they're found in nature that seem to be remarkably beneficial and therapeutic for certain disorders. All right. Well, so, yeah, I think that's another thing on the horizon. And uh, hopefully, you know, in the not so distant future, you know, we can, I can start doing some research in this in the lab, some basic science research, which our lab is very much about moving the science to human application. But for me, as a basic science researcher, I like to see the effects like in model systems and then develop implementation protocols that can be applied to humans. So that's kind of what what motivates me a lot to mechanistically understand how it's working before I apply it. But in the meantime, sometimes I apply it to myself before I actually develop <laughs> the protocol. <laughs> it's kind of been the story of my research. Well, fantastic. I'll have to get you back to talk about all the upcoming research from your lab. Uh, but thank like you so it. much for your time. It's been wonderful. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, and if people want to learn more about what we're doing, yeah, I'm going to plug my website, ketonutrition.org. So you can go. We, we don't sell anything. It's just an information website for now. So I encourage people to look at the blog because I go into more in-depth about many of the things I talked about. Here. And I'll definitely link to it as well. So uh, great, it's definitely, thank you. It was helpful when I was starting my keto journey. So yeah, I'll, oh, I'm thank sure you. It's Appreciate be that. To people. Hi again, everyone. 
Thank you so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you want to support the creation of the podcast, consider sharing it, leaving a review on Apple Podcasts, or signing up to be a premium member and receive transcripts. You can also donate on Patreon, which is patreon.com forward slash live longer world and connect with me on Twitter where my handle is live longer world. Lastly, all information and resources can be found at livelongerworld.com.